Hey, what's up, everybody? Just a quick note before we get into today's episode. Uh, this is our Christmas episode, and as such, uh, there is some discussion about Santa Claus. So if you're listening to this with your children around, uh, about the 16 minute and 30 second mark is when we, uh, when we start talking about them. So if you are not ready to have that conversation, with your child, if you know what I mean, we would urge you to either uh, listen without them or uh, just skip to the end at 1630. We hope you enjoy today's podcast. Ready for a podcast focused on conversations, community, and culture? Then grab your headphones and get ready for NCC Unplugged. We're breaking free from the traditional sermon format to engage in raw conversations about faith, life, and everything in between. So join us as we unplug from the noise of everyday life and plug into something more. This is NCC Unplugged. Conversations, community, and culture. All right. Well, we made it to episode two. You made it to episode two. We're excited to continue this podcast format. My name is Jeff Terpstra. I'm the preaching minister here at Norwin Christian Church. Since this episode is coming out right before Christmas, we thought we'd talk a little bit here with the staff about our own Christmas traditions. We'll get behind some of the things that we do here at NCC as a church for Christmas, some of the philosophy we have behind our Christmas events and the way we treat our Christmas Eve service. Talk about that a little bit. Uh, So we're excited during this season. We have the decorations up at our houses, around our church, and so we're excited about the different things uh, that we do for Christmas. But Allison, what are some of the things that you do at your house for Christmas, maybe some of the traditions you have? I'm especially excited about this conversation because we have this unofficial motto in our house, we're the Murrays. We make a tradition out of making traditions. So this is like the perfect conversation for me to be a part of because I feel like we make a tradition out of everything. And at one point, Lily looked up online, and I think in order for something to be a tradition, you have to do it for, it was either two years or three years. So the kids like to mark like, oh, we've done this three times. It's an official tradition now. Um, I think our very favorite family tradition would be after Christmas Eve service here at NCC, we always get in the car, we stop at Sheets for cocoa and a snack, and then we drive around to various neighborhoods in the area looking at Christmas lights. And it's a nostalgic tradition for me because when the kids were really little, when they were babies and toddlers, we would bring their PJs here to church and change them. Um, before we would leave so that they were already kind of ready for bed after we looked at Christmas lights. And so even though we don't do that part of it anymore, it it every time we get ready to get in the car and do it, it makes Jim and I pause and look at each other and say, do you remember when they were babies and we would put them in their Christmas PJs? So that's probably the tradition that I um, hold most dear Um, But we do so many other things to prepare for the Christmas season, different Advent readings or, um, you know, different ornaments that have to go on the tree every year and which kid hangs which ornament and all those kind of things. Yeah. And if you ever see the Murray Christmas tree during the Christmas season, I would say there's close to 200 ornaments. Jeez. It is. (laughs) We've never counted, but it is. It is probably maybe even at this point more than that. We just got back from a vacation in November, and we added three more ornaments just from that one trip. <laughs> Are they all, like, special ornaments, or do you have any just generic bulbs? They are all special oh ornaments. If they are not special, they don't get on the tree because there's, mm. there's just not room for them. So it's either they've been given as a gift, or each year um, we buy each child an ornament. So Lily and Cooper have like their own that when they um, get married and leave our home, then they will be able to kind of start their family tree with the ornaments that they've been collecting over the years. We couldn't do ornaments on our tree this year because as soon as Isabella bought, brought up the Christmas box of stuff, which Isabella did November 1st, so like she mm-hmm. decorates as soon as, usually it's in October, but this year she waited until November. 
and self control. Yeah, <laughs> self control. <laughs> so she brought it up and put up the tree, put the first ornament like on the tree, turned around, and Grayson had broken three. <laughs> so <laughs> ornaments are not on our tree. Oh, I remember those days. So what, Garrett, what is your your Christmas tradition that you always look forward to? We don't have one yet for Isabella and I, per se, as far as um, what we do as a family. That's probably going to evolve more with as Grayson gets older. Um, but we have ones that I inherited. Um, so the big one for us, that now that we're closer to home, because when we were living in Tennessee and Kentucky, we never would be able to make it up early for Christmas. Uh, we'd always have a Christmas Eve service at church, so um, we weren't able to engage with all the stuff that my family did. But we, all, my family always does a cookie baking, um, gingerbread cookie, and we go all out. There's a special family recipe we use, um, and we ice them and decorate them and have prizes for the, the best decorations and... Um, so that that's something we're really looking forward to be a part of this year now that we're closer to to my family we can join in on that um on christmas day we would always which is probably a tradition for a lot of people we'd always read the uh the christmas story um before doing anything um and then for me growing up my mom always used to say because we did santa growing up um she always used to say that Santa came a day early in West Virginia because we would have our Christmas on the 24th. And then we would go to my, my grandparents' house in Bedford, Pennsylvania, and we would have, we'd go to their Christmas Eve service, which we would always, my, my grandparents were Lutheran. So there's something nostalgic to me about Christmas Eve and Good Friday services at a Lutheran church because that just was what we would do every year. And I loved it. Um, but then we would have Christmas morning with my grandparents every year. Very cool. So. Excellent. What about you, Joshua? What are some things at your house that you enjoy doing around Christmas time? Well, Aaron is super serious about Christmas, and our children are. And so kind of like Garrett, they were, they, were, they were asking me to get the decorations out in early November, mm-hmm. and I was kind of pushing it off, and it didn't happen until Thanksgiving. But like right now, on the kitchen table is uh, kind of an advent countdown, and it's kind of a little spiral, and you've got kind of Mary and Joseph on the donkey, and they're kind of going around to the cool. counting down the days. So advent is big, and the advent devotionals that go along with that. And it's interesting because when I was growing up, uh, Christmas, we, we travel kind of like Garrett. We travel to my grandmother. So when I thought of Christmas, I thought of traveling for eight hours out of state yeah. Uh, but but my wife really wants to be home, and so we're always kind of going back and forth on on what we're going to do. But uh, yeah, Advent is really big, and just understanding the meaning as we go through the Advent season. Is it, so talk to talk about Advent a little bit more for those that maybe hear that word, but you know Advent time. Okay, what does that exactly mean? Yeah, so Advent is just a tradition in a church calendar, and like. At NCC, we're not super big on the church calendar holistically, but a lot of, like Garrett mentioned, the Lutheran churches, sometimes we say maybe the more liturgical churches, they follow the church calendar. So Advent is are the four, I might might not get it exactly right, but it's, uh, it's kind of the four Sundays before Christmas or including Christmas, and it's uh, similar to how you might do Lent before Easter. It's just a time of focusing in on what, we're looking forward to with Christmas and spiritually uh, preparing ourselves and putting ourselves in that mindset to really appreciate what we're celebrating in Christmas. And I've done a lot of reading the last couple of years to kind of try to understand that tradition a little more because it's something that I've really come to look forward to. And the word Advent means a coming. And so I think it's so neat because a lot of, of what I've read in, in some adult Advent devotionals over the last couple of years is how we look um, not just to Jesus's first coming as a baby at Christmas, but as Christians, we also want to be waiting expectantly for his second coming. And so I love that that word encompasses both of those times and that whole continuity of God's plan. Well, and just historically speaking, too, the the origination of Christmas was to, in the early church, 
coincided with the festivals of the winter solstice. Um, so when the Roman Empire became Christianized under Constantine, the the solution for the festivals of the Roman Empire was do we, we either Christianize them or abolish them, and they became Christianized. And so Jesus was, was not born December 25th. Most scholars would say it was probably in April that he was born. And But we celebrate Jesus' birth on Christmas because it's the festival of the winter solstice in the Roman Empire. And so a lot of times those festivals would run more than one day. They would run weeks. And so Christmas, historically speaking, is not something that's celebrated one day, at least in the Roman Empire. It went over a series of days, and it wasn't until the Middle Ages where um, Christmas got its name off of the Catholic Christ's Mass, so it's like the special Mass for Christ um, within the Catholic Church. But if you go all the way back to when Christianity was legalized in Rome, that's when those long stretched out festivals of like the winter solstice coincided with Christmas and and same thing with with Easter and things like that. So there's historical basis for 12 days of Christmas. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes, and I always thought it was the 12 days leading up to Christmas, but I just learned a couple of years ago that it's actually starting at Christmas and the 12 days after yeah. that leading up to Epiphany or, mm. you know, January 6th. Yeah, if you look at so I I don't do this anymore, but I used to base my Bible reading on the Book of Common Prayer by Thomas Cranmer, um, which is Anglican, but a lot of the Anglican calendars coincide with the Catholic calendars. Anyway, um, the uh, if you look at those calendars, there's dates for everything, and you can almost be overwhelmed by it, but the point of it is to be liturgical in your reading, that you're being purposeful in what you're reading, that you're not just unstructured in your reading and in your worship and, and in an illiterate society like the early Middle Ages and early church would have been, this was a way to bring people together to recognize what it is that they were worshiping and and and, and develop some sort of system that brought community together in a church that was not an ethnicity but was scattered all around the world. And so... You know, we, like you said, where Christmas leads to Epiphany, and then Epiphany leads further. It's none of them are just one day; they're a series of days that lead to the next day and to the next series, just to kind of you know keep people moving in church. Well, thanks for sharing that. Um, so, Jonathan, this is your first Christmas as a married couple. That's exciting. It is exciting. Yes. Do you have any thoughts as to traditions to start? Maybe some you've already had as. Uh, dating couple, but now married, things are different. Anything you're going to do different, maybe start those traditions? Yeah, so last year we had these like string lights that we hung on one of the walls, and it looked awesome. And then this year we took them out and looked at each other and then just put them right back in the box. So that tradition didn't last. (laughs) Um, But I think a tradition that we're going to keep is um, this year, like instead of like setting a budget or trying to like surprise each other necessarily with gifts we kind of set like a category it was like she was going to get us like a board game and I was going to get us like um, a Nintendo Switch game and then it's like the gift is more so doing those things throughout the day like in the morning Um, and then we're still on the double schedule of like her family my family Mm -hmm. in the same day so we do a lot of driving on Christmas and Thanksgiving Um, but yeah I'm excited to see what traditions we start Um, I remember a tradition from Like, my home growing up was we would always, my brother and I, my mom's a photographer, obviously, so we would be in front of the tree, and then, like, she would take the picture. But this continued, like, not just when we were little. Like, probably last year we did this. (laughs) Like, I was 21, and he's this massive, like, 18-year-old guy, and we're (laughs) squeezing next on the tree, so it's just fun. Yeah. Yeah, good. Yeah, and I think when I think of my family and traditions... I think like you, Jonathan, we probably don't call them traditions, but they're just things that we automatically do every Christmas, Uh, pulling out the ornaments and retelling the stories about who made the ornament or when the picture was taken. We do the same Christmas decorations in the same places in our house. We typically get all of those out the day after Thanksgiving. This year we did a little bit early, Uh, but like Allison said, we go look at lights as well in the car, and so 
just all those things that remind us to spend time with each other, and that family is so important during Christmas time, uh, and all of those things that we do. Matt, what about you and your family for traditions? Yeah, I have uh, three that come to mind that we kind of look at as traditions. Uh, the first one, every year I buy Dana and the kids a new ornament for the tree um, based off of what their current likes are, just something sentimental that means something uh, to them. Uh, we do a PJ cookie milk drive every year. So uh, usually Juliet and Dana will bake the cookies and then we change into our pajamas and we get a cup of milk and load into the car and then just go around uh, different neighborhoods um, eating our cookies, drinking our milk. Uh, I am not drinking milk and eating cookies while I'm driving. I'm a safe driver. Uh, <laughs> listen to Christmas music and just look at Christmas lights uh, with the family. Uh, the kids, we started it one year just, you know, Dana was like, it'd be fun. And now the we all look forward to it every year. In fact, once we started putting Christmas decorations up this year, that was one of the very first things Levi and Juliet asked, like, what are we doing the cookie drive? So, And then uh, the the last one, um, and this is just kind of fun and, and silly that we do. Uh, Juliet's 15 and Levi's 11. Uh, we still make reindeer food. Uh, every night after we come, or every uh, Christmas Eve after we come back from service at church, we get out a bowl and mix together oats and sprinkles and I hate glitter, but glitter and carrots and put it in a bowl and put it out on the, uh, on the back uh, stoop for the reindeer because Santa gets enough cookies. The reindeers often get overlooked. So. It sounded edible to you put the glitter in there. <laughs> yeah. So what do you do with it? What do you do with it after Christmas morning? Obviously you're not eating it. Well, the reindeer eat it. It's not there anymore. <laughs> there the point. Here we go. I think I think Pennsylvania's got plenty of deer to take care of that. <laughs> yeah. So we'll put a warning in here. We're gonna we're gonna <coughs> talk about the man in the the red suit for a little bit. So if there's little ears around you that you want to protect from, uh, maybe learning some things that you as a parent uh, aren't ready to tell them, maybe now's the time to to put your headphones on instead of listening to it through your phone. But for those around the table, what do you guys do when it comes to Santa, especially with your kids? So that was a question Dana and I really struggled with when the kids were little. What do we do? Because I think, and I know for Allie, we've had this conversation before. The, the fear for us was if we talk about Santa and then as they grow older and find out he wasn't real... Um, would that then somehow hinder them from believing in Jesus or God or other things that we've told them? Um, but after much you know thought and going back and forth on it, we we decided to go ahead with it. We were going to be careful with it. We didn't center the entire day around Santa. We didn't center all of the presents they got around Santa. They knew that mommy and daddy bought most of the presents, and there was usually one present from Santa. And we really wouldn't make it like the biggest present from Santa because mom and dad wanted some of the credit too, right? <laughs> um, so as the, as they grew uh, grew older um, and kind of found out on their own um, the truth about Santa, uh, they still you know like to have fun with it. They know the realities of it uh, right now, um, but thankfully it it did nothing to hinder their belief in God or Jesus. Um, and that's that's a conversation that we've had with them once they they learn the truth about Santa. So something fun, but we don't make the entire day or leading up to about it. And I guess as as Matt's sister, we actually Jim and I did very similar things. Um, and so when we you know did Santa and the magic of of all of that. Obviously, we made sure that the focus on Jesus' birth was the center of our Christmas. And I think that our kids figured it out earlier than most because Santa wasn't the priority. Um, so they they believed for quite a while, but then when they stopped, um, we heard them talking one day about how, well, we think the writing is the same as mom's. Yeah. 
And that was kind of the thing that tipped them off a little bit. Um, and Jim and I decided that year we were just going to let that go and see if they, you know, continued believing. Um, and they did for like one more year and then that was it. But something fun that kind of came out of that is our kids, um, never had an elf on a shelf because we didn't want to go that like extra amount with, with Santa. And a couple of years ago, I heard them say, you know, it would have been fun if we could have done that. So Lily is now 16 and Cooper is 13 and we are now the proud owners of an elf on the shelf. Uh. <laughs> um, so it's super fun because they will help move the elf around the house and we do very low key things because we're not trying to convince anyone that the elf is actually moving around on its own or anything like that. So that what? has been like, <laughs> that's been a super silly, like fun new tradition is to see where it shows up um, because all four of us can participate since they don't have to keep, you know, or we don't have to keep the magic going for them. And real quick to interject too, growing up, we, our parents never did the Santa Claus thing. But knowing that, like, as a kid, I still loved all the, like, the magical, like, festivities and stuff surrounding him. Um, so it was it was always cool to me. One of my favorite ornaments is this old, from the 80s, this this blow mold, glow mold, I don't know what they're called, uh, plastic Santa Claus, just like the traditional what you think of Santa Claus, the paint's falling off. I think when I was a baby, I chewed his ear off. So it's, <laughs> it's, it's dilapidated, but that like going back to, to traditions, that gets the, the center spot on our Christmas tree every year. I think in our house, we're very similar to what you guys said about yours, your traditions with Santa. We decided that we would do Santa mainly because of what you just said, Matt, there's, I don't know, some nostalgia and magic behind it and some awe. And we knew with our kids being in public school, they're just going to hear it. Even if we don't introduce it, they're going to get wrapped up in the other the things. And um, for instance, on Thursday at my uh, daughter's school, they have Santa letter writing to Santa. And so I'm going to go in and I don't know, it's a neat opportunity for me to sit with my daughters for a little bit and write this pretend letter to Santa, but they're doing it uh, to raise money. And so it's going to go to a certain foundation, and so I'm going to bring a few bucks with me to do, to write a letter to Santa. And so there's some neat things that can go along with it. But we decided as, as far as we do it, we're not going to lie about it. And so when they come with some very pointed questions about, well, how does Santa get to every house or how did this happen – uh, that's when we'll start unveiling the the truth about, okay, well, Santa's actually just part of the fantasy of Christmas and getting caught up in some of the things. And so, like you said, Allison, I think our kids probably learned the truth a little bit earlier than some other kids did. But we told them, hey, there's other kids that still believe, and it's really fun for them to believe, so never spoil it for them. Never be that person uh, that ruins that magic of, of Christmas for them. And so... Um, yeah, Santa doesn't get center stage, never did at our house. Uh, we we kind of played into it a little bit, but we never burdened ourselves with it. And that's part of the reason I sighed when I heard Elf on the Shelf, because all I know about Elf on the Shelf is how much parents on Facebook mm -hmm. complain about it. Right. And so for every time I hear that, I want to say, but that's your own fault. <laughs> <laughs> You're the one that introduced that. You're the one that introduced that burden on yourself. And um, don't create harder work for yourself when it comes to Elf on the Shelf or for Santa. And, you know, you have to buy different wrapping paper and you need to wake up at midnight to put it out and all that stuff that we do trying to get our kids to buy into the fantasy and coming, you know, everybody on this podcast is coming from a Christian worldview, understanding that it's it's Christ's birth that we're really celebrating. And so to have that at the, at the center stage, and we don't want anything to try to steal that, but there is some some magic and nostalgia that goes along with it. And so we've tried to balance that in our own household, not not pushing that on anybody that's listening, not, not thinking that's the only way to do it. Um, but that's just how we've done it personally. And so Jonathan and Garrett, for you guys, Jonathan, you don't have a little one yet. Garrett, you have a very little one. How have you guys been thinking through this process in your own families when it comes to Santa and how to introduce them into 
the life of the little one or maybe not at all. So maybe I'm the humbug of the group. I don't know. Um, we, <clears throat> we talked about this last night, actually. I don't think we're going to tell him about Santa in the sense that we're going to like, Isabella said, I don't want Santa getting any of the credit for the things <laughs> that, that we get. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, but it's more in that too. We, um, we love fiction. I mean, I'm huge Lord of the Rings, Star Wars, like all that. And I would, we have no problem watching fictional shows on Santa. Um, but we don't want to steal away from, from Christ. And I, I get what everyone's saying. Like it, it doesn't do that if you do it intentionally. Um, but we just, we want to make sure that we're not, um, we don't want him to, like Matt said, distrust us by emphasizing Santa. So we're going to show Santa movies and like enjoy what happens around Santa, but we're not going to try to kind of engage in the fictional nature of it in our house. Mm -hmm. When I was little, we believed in Santa, my brothers and sisters and I, and I always wore my heart on my sleeve growing up. And I remember distinctly whenever I found out Santa wasn't real, I cried for like five hours. I'm with so, you. I did too. <laughs> so like I, if Grayson's anything like me, I don't want that to happen to him. So. Well, I'm glad you brought that up. So growing up, I was the youngest child and my parents just forgot to tell me that Santa wasn't real <laughs> because they just figured I knew it at that point because my older brother and my older sister knew. And so yeah. it, it came out in casual conversation one time and it was kind of like a... Jeff, you don't know he's not real. And I was just devastated. Oh, no. And so it, it was, yeah. Well, my, my twin traumatic. brother, me, I'm a twin. And so there was... Uh, what? Oh, you didn't know what? that? I did not know that. <laughs> yeah, so I have a, we're very much unalike. So he's left-handed, I'm right-handed. He's short, I'm tall. But they, they, they don't get along so well that... His twin moved to the other side of the country. Yeah. <laughs> he lives in Iowa now solely so he can hunt big bucks. Like that's He literally moved to Iowa just to hunt. But he has a great name. Josh, yeah. yeah. But I get, yeah. Joshua goes by Joshua. My brother's name is Joshua, but I have to call him Josh. Like He would never answer Joshua, so it's getting confusing sometimes. <laughs> but anyway, we, we did everything together growing up. Obviously, we're twins. Um. But we were very different people. Like, I was very emotionally driven and reacted very strongly to certain things. And he was just very stoic always growing up. And mom, I guess something was happening in school where we were starting to have doubts or questions about Santa. And mom brought us both into her room and said, no, I need to tell you something. Santa isn't real. And Josh just looked at her and said, okay. And I said, what? No! And just went on this tangent of crying for the next five hours. So that's the story of the difference of my brother. <laughs> and that's why he goes and hunks Buck and you're that's, a minister. Yeah. <laughs> it's ironic, though, because now I, f I sometimes feel like I'm the emotionalist one and he's the one that's full of emotion and excitement. And we switched. So we haven't talked about it like in detail. I mean, we've talked about it like casually now and then. I mean, I think the idea that I'm going to pitch when we talk about this is kind of what my parents did, which I think is what most people would gravitate towards. But like, so they they never talked about it at all, but they were like open to if he wants to talk about it, we'll talk about it. I never believed in Santa. I don't know why. Um, my aunt Missy will tell the story all the time of we went to a gas station and I think I was like four, and this the cashier was like, "Have you been good? Like, what's Santa gonna bring you this year?" And according to the to the legend, I was like, "Santa's not real." Like, <laughs> and this woman didn't know what to do. Um, but I just I don't know. Like, I never did. I, and partly maybe because my parents never talked about it. Like, they ne we never did the cookies and milk or anything like that. And um, so, but they would always tell me like, you know, when you go to school, don't be telling people like. Other people have this excitement. and uh, My brother kind of believed when he was real little. Like, he did... All he wanted to do was put out cookies. That was the only part of it he wanted. Like, they never signed anything Santa on the presents or anything like that. Um, so, I mean, I, th I think going into it, like, just wait and see if they bring it up and where it goes if they don't care about it. 
we won't care about it if they do. We'll do some of it, um, but that's kind of my idea. I'd love to see some statistics on Gen Z and like the tail end of millennials and how they're raising their kids with Santa, because a lot of statistics are showing that Gen Z is very um, truth driven. Like they want to know what's real and what's not. So like I'm a tail end millennial technically, and you would be Gen Z, right? Yeah. So Mm -hmm. I, I feel like we have a difference of how we're approaching teaching things like that than maybe our older millennial counterparts. I think you all are millennials, right? That's me. Yeah. And your older millennial. Yeah. A little, <laughs> yeah. little bit Beyond. of generation yeah. X okay. going on yeah. over yeah. here. I'm 1995, <laughs> the very last year you could be a millennial. Yeah. yeah. I have my first, um, I think this summer will be the first generation of youth that come into the program that are not in mm. Gen Z, which is weird. Yeah. You're growing up. I know. It's great. <laughs> I'm a real adult. <laughs> Joshua, what about you guys and how you've approached the topic of Santa at home? Yeah, we kind of we kind of land where Garrett is that we haven't we've kind of unsubscribed to Santa, Tooth Fairy, uh, Easter Bunny, but we still read the Santa books. It's just they understand, hey, this is it's it's not true, and and we have those same conversations. It's like, hey, don't don't spoil this for anybody else, and it's an interesting conversation to have because I think we're very sensitive about Santa because of where it plays into Christmas and because of what a big what a big deal Christmas is in our culture and our families. But then, you know, as Garrett mentioned, there's a lot of fictional stories that relate to the gospel story, and we see the value of those and and how those come together. So uh, it's kind of neat to see the spectrum of where all the different families are. We all have the same goal and kind of how we approach this particular issue. Yeah, so, I mean, thinking about Santa here at the church, uh, and our last topic on the podcast was about doing things purposeful and how purposeful we are with approaching some of those things here at the church when it comes to the Easter Bunny or Santa Claus. We know that we have very limited time with uh, students and kids, and so we do our best to never confuse uh, cultural assumptions about those holidays or fictional characters with what they're really about. And so if you come to our Christmas fest, uh, we're not going to have a Santa running across the stage. We're not going to have Santa decorations. If you come to what we do around Easter time, you'll never see the Easter bunny or different things, not because we're completely against them, but again, we know we want to do everything purposeful in our power to uh, be focused during those times. And I think um, when we think about at the beginning of this conversation, the traditions that we all held most dear, most of them had nothing to do with Santa or any of the things surrounding that. And so I think Um, As families, no matter what decision we make uh, surrounding Santa, we can see that this holiday season still brings us so many good memories, so much richness, and and still almost that that exciting, magical time of year, um, whether we bring Santa into the mix or not. And so I think um, I would just encourage you as listeners when you're thinking through these things for your families, um, don't don't make this like a make or break it thing. Like, like, like we're saying, either you do it or you don't do it. But instead, think about how are you going to point your family towards Christ, and what are some of the things you're going to do to just strengthen the family culture that you have, and those traditions are going to last. Uh, a, a lifetime for your kids or for your nieces and nephews or, or your neighbors or or whoever you uh, welcome into your Christmas celebrations. I think kind of tying what you're saying there into our conversation earlier about the uh, Christian festivals matching pagan festivals, the, the festival that Christmas is matching coincided with the winter solstice, but it was called the Festival of of the unconquerable sun, which is this festival that the sun is returning because the winter solstice is coming, and they, the Roman Empire had this festival of worshiping the unconquerable sun, and this festival became Christianized, and so rather than it being the S-O-N, unconquerable sun, it became this festival of the Son of God, the light of the world. And so you see this coordination of 
taking what is secular and pagan and moving it into a, tying it into who what we're actually worshiping and so i think to certain degrees we can do that with santa we can do that with with different holidays um that are secular but but like you're saying we need to be intentional about how we're doing that and think through it as well we do a lot around here during Christmas, and we want to offer those opportunities to you and your family to experience those different things. Of course, we have our Christmas Eve service, uh, and this year Christmas Eve is on a Sunday, so our times are a little bit different than normal. Uh, for normal Christmas Eve, we do them towards the evening, uh, but this year, because it's on a Sunday, we're going to have one Christmas Eve service in the morning at 930, and then we have two Christmas Eve services, um, not quite in the evening, but late afternoon. We have four and six o'clock, and all three of those services are going to be identical. So whichever one serves you and your family the best, if you come in the morning so that you can eat with family later, uh, eat in the morning, come to one of the services later, we really uh, love to have you join us for one of those services. Yeah, and uh, just a reminder, the 930 service will be available via live stream. There we go. Our Matt, Matt, our tech director, always reminding us about our online options. We definitely appreciate him making those available for us. I'm excited about our theme this year. We've been doing the names of Jesus. And for our Christmas Eve service, we're going to be looking at the name Prince of Peace. And Joshua and I were actually at a minister's meeting yesterday talking about some different things happening in the church. And I was telling them that we're talking about the Prince of Peace and how in our day and age, peace isn't, isn't a word that necessarily we always seek after. Um, it's not something on our top 10 list of things that we are excited about in life until we don't have it you know, or we, we realize the need for it. And then, then we do seek after that peace. And when you do a study on peace in Scripture, just how often it's talked about, here are some of the words that the angels speak uh, once Jesus uh, is being ready to be born. Uh, Luke chapter 2, verse 14 says, Glory to God in the highest heaven. And on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. These are some of the first words of the angel's proclamation of what Jesus is going to bring. He's going to bring peace on earth. Uh, maybe in our day and age, we see the need for it because of the wars around us. But there's something so much greater to peace on an individual level. And when he, Jesus can bring peace to our very souls and our hearts. And so I'm excited to communicate that on Christmas Eve and um, really hope you join us. You invite your family and friends to join us as well for our Christmas Eve services. And so with that, we sign off on our second podcast, our second episode. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Thank you for tuning in to NCC Unplugged. If you've enjoyed listening to our podcast, we encourage you to share this with your friends and family. NCC Unplugged is available on all major podcast platforms. And if you're ever interested in experiencing Norwin Christian Church firsthand, we invite you to join us for our services every Sunday at 845 and 1030 a.m. We have engaging classes available for all ages, ensuring there's something meaningful for everyone in our church community. For more information about NCC or any other inquiries, visit norwinchristianchurch.com 